Hello everyone and welcome back to my N1 special in Kerbal Space Program 0.23 and here we are on our way to the moon with Danwin Kerman and the L3 stage of the N1 rocket. Now, in the previous episode I demonstrated a few things about the N1 rocket, the Soviet attempt to launch a man to the moon, and uh, one of the things was that they could have done without the 30 rockets at the bottom. Uh, the and the reason why they had to have 30 rockets is because they didn't have any uh, faith in the reliability of the fuel feed situation or the reliability of the rockets because, of course, there was that issue with not being able to work with the main rocket manufacturer and those rockets that they actually ended up with were actually manufactured by Kuznetsov, the jet manufacturer in the Soviet Union. So if, Sergei, uh, if Korolev had been able to uh, work with Glushko, they would have been able to make more successful rockets, but Glushko was absolutely adamant about uh, making sure that it didn't work, basically. Uh, so, so Korolev didn't have any chance. They could have done with about 20 to 24 rockets based on the throttle that I had on the way up, and Korolev probably would have re redesigned the rocket if he had had the NK-33s that we were using, which is the upgraded version of the NK-15s. Um, that would have simplified the fuel flow si uh, situation, obviously, but also it would have made the bottom stage thinner instead of having it so wide, instead of it being 17 meters wide compared to the Saturn V's 10 meters, it would have been a thinner stage and uh, perhaps he could have made it also a taller stage to, for the fuel situation, though I don't think he would have needed to. But as long as it was thinner, it would have had less drag, and drag was a huge impediment to the way the whole thing was operating. So that would have been a much better situation. Um, other than that, of course, the fuel flow, the whole fuel management system for the 30 rockets could have been improved if they had had the funding. Uh, Korolev was working with far less funding than his uh, American counterparts and also uh, a very confusing bureaucracy. So uh, it didn't have the support of the uh, manufacturers the way the Saturn program did in America. So there were a lot of impediments to this actually working that we don't have to deal with in Kerbal Space Program, thankfully. We don't have to worry about any of that. Now though I have to face impediments that uh, they didn't have. Uh, first of all, in the previous episode, the third stage, or was it the fourth stage? There's still so many stages to this thing. The, the lunar transit stage. The lunar transit stage had an issue where the engine kept overheating for some reason, I have no idea why, and eventually it actually blew up, it just blew off. So uh, all that fuel in that stage ended up wasted because I, I don't think we, could have, uh, we, we couldn't have uh, used it here anyway. This is liquid fuel oxidizer. That was uh, uh, liquid H2 and uh, um, liquid oxygen. So it would have been useful and we had no way of transferring it anyway. But um, yeah, so all that fuel was wasted. So we lost a lot of Delta V there uh, because of that engine. Even though I tried to fire it very carefully, it still managed to uh, go beyond its limits. Um, so we have less fuel than we need, and also I didn't really plan on this being uh, successful, I mean actually landing on the moon and everything. Uh, so I only brought Danwin with me, and the problem with that is, of course, if we do decide to take him to the moon landing, this whole section ends up being unmanned, and I've got remote tech installed, and I've got no satellites. Well, I've got this one really alpha but uh, I don't think that's gonna be good enough if if that can maintain communication with this well I mean it's possible but it doesn't matter because I did not put a remote controller on this top portion so totally doesn't matter whether I can maintain communication or not I didn't intend for this to be unmanned anyway so this would be unmanned which doesn't make docking with it impossible it just makes it extremely difficult um, and then the, you have to think about the fuel situation here where uh, we've got some nitrous oxide which is our RCS fuel here but uh, not much of it. The RCS ports are in fact placed uh, where the RCS ports on the lander would have been it was they were at the top here so I got that much right. The fuel tank configuration I'm not too sure about 
And I actually, I think I got a good approximation for the amount of fuel this lander had, but it's not quite precise. On the bright side, the capsules that I have here are actually lighter than the capsules that they had. So, so you know, maybe that makes things more efficient. The overall uh, mass of this was correct. I think that's one of the reasons I added more food and water and oxygen, by the way. More than we really need for this mission. It was because I wanted to get the mass right. So, without adding more Delta V than the vehicle would have originally had. So, the, the Delta V is right, the mass is right for the overall vehicle, but uh, certain portions like the lander might be slightly lighter than they would have been. Okay, so we are on our way to the moon and I'll... Uh, well, let's time warp a tiny bit first to see whether electric charge is okay and everything's stable. And then if everything is alright. And yeah, it looks alright. I'll uh, see you in the moon sphere of influence. Okay, so here we are in the Moon Sphere of Influence, and uh, full disclosure, along the way, Tac Life Support warned me that the Apollo Pod was actually running out of food, water, and oxygen. Uh, so I I retrieved that. Uh, I had not uh, retrieved Jeb, Bill, and Bob yet, but uh, Tac Life Support warned me, and I did. So now let's get uh, closer to the Moon. So a periapsis of 44 kilometers sounds fine. So we'll do that burn now. Let's see if our engine can ignite at all. If not, I might leave it off and uh, fuel flow is very stable, so I'll just use it. Um, if it wasn't, I'd just uh, try it with RCS since we have uh, sufficient nitrous oxide. Okay, there's the maneuver node. So whether or not we uh, actually make a moon landing will depend on how the fuel situation is. I'm not sure right now how things will shape up. Okay, 50 is good. We've got a very inclined orbit, but I don't see us uh, fixing that right now. Maybe, maybe we can, yeah. Yeah, we can. There we go. Should have done it in the same burn, though. I can see the inclination using the custom info window, so I'll just uh, take it from here. No, I guess we can continue like this. Okay, that's the limit. All right, so it'll be nine degrees. That's not too bad. Oh, and we ended up with a higher periapsis. Let me correct that with uh, RCS. Really, the nitrous oxide is like on a totally different scale from any of the other RCS fuels. Don't know how that works out, but anyway. Somewhat deceptive. It looks like I've got tons and tons here when it's not really that much. Really shouldn't have these ones firing. They wouldn't be doing any good anyway right now. Okay, that's close enough. Let me see now. Try and oh, the shrouds in the way. Uh, well, the actually the RCS tank is this one. Oh, we should take uh, RCS off. It's leaking a bit. So I can transfer it back in here. The liquid uh, hydrogen is actually for the fuel cells here. So that's that. Mm, though we don't seem to need the fuel cells at this point. 
All right, so plotting for orbit around the moon. Okay, I'll, I'll want to keep the... No, that's that's about right anyway. That would be a fine, uh, fine orbit. Whether we wanted to, uh, whether we needed to rendezvous with the lander or not, that would be a fine orbit. Okay. So there's the moon. There's Danwin. We'll have to move him to the lander if we actually want to do the landing. But uh, I'll see how much uh, energy we have. I don't know if we'll have enough. I don't think so. Because this stage really was entirely meant to uh, help with the descent of the lander. And remember, orbital speed around the moon is about 1600 meters per second. Right now we have uh, 1,599 in this tank, but we're going to be burning 788 of that just to get into orbit. And uh, that was 788 that uh, we would have used um, earlier. Uh, that, that was used uh, as part of the lunar um, transit that uh, we shouldn't have had to have used from this stage. Okay. So as is so typical, we are be on the dark side for the burn. So yeah, I'm I'm not. I don't think I've got enough for a real uh, landing. Not if I want to uh, keep Danwin safe, and I do. I mean, I'm not going to be uh, reckless with him. The lander itself, uh, aside from this stage that we're burning right now, the lander itself really only has fuel to make the final descent and then the ascent afterwards. So it wouldn't have been possible to uh, to make so much of the descent with it. 800 uh, meters per second worth. Gonna have to figure out what happened with that. Uh, yeah, with that lunar transit stage, I'll have to figure out what went wrong with that. Whoa, whoa. We are now... Well, I guess the low per if we're not going to land, then the low periapsis will be good and dramatic, so uh, I'll keep it like that. Let's uh, actually point him prograde and see if we can't get a better look at the moon now. So we'll uh, go over to light side and see how it looks. We are now Apollo 8-ish. Mm, let's change the view to be more Apollo 8-ish. Okay, looks like there's some drama afoot. Let's see. It's very dark right now though, but I'm expecting a sunrise. And I want to turn to face it. Okay. Ooh, wow. The sun looks so far in the real real solar system mod. And it just doesn't splay the landscape with light the way the way I want it to. <laughs> when you have a sunrise like that. Huh. Of course, uh, there's no atmosphere to scatter the light the way we have on Earth, but still. Anyway, uh, you can see that we're going Okay, good. Anyway, uh, you can see that we're going 1,673 meters per second, and this stage currently only has 784, even though it would have to have been able to kill all of this velocity. 
So we are not going to be landing, and that's that. What we will do is see if we can see Earthrise. Well, we'll have to tilt a little bit like this. Oh wait, uh, the inclination will be make it complicated, won't it? Uh, where would Kerbin slash Earth be if uh, well, now that we've got this situation? Come on. Mm. Where are we? Oh, well, that's not good. Um, currently, it's it's uh, like a new moon for uh, Kerbin slash Earth, so uh, they've got just this view. So uh, it'll be dark when when the moon comes up. Not quite as dramatic that way because you can't see the landscape. Oh well. We'll make uh, one more go around. We'll dump this stuff and uh, only take the command and service, well, the equivalent of the command and service module. The, I guess it's called the LOK for this uh, for the Soyuz. Soyuz 7K-LOK, I think was its uh, designation. I've, I don't know what they called it in Russian. So we'll only take the command and service module back. We'll dump the lander and its uh, descent stage. Oh, there, there's Kerbin. Oh, it's not too bad. Still seems much smaller than I would have expected. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm satisfied. I think uh, Danwin is satisfied too. Let's make sure Danwin is in the right place. So uh, he has to be up here, and I think uh, I had already checked that. But let's just double check to make sure because we don't want to lose Kerbals. Uh, yeah, this, this is the port, right? Yeah, Danwin's there. All right, so there's no reason to about anything in particular. This does have a lot of fuel though. wonder if it would have been able, but I don't want to take any risks with Danwin. We'll, we'll have to do another mission sometime with uh, more than one Kerbal and make sure we've got another Kerbal up here and one Kerbal in the lander can and do it all properly. I don't feel like I've uh, prepared properly for it this time. So, uh, so yeah, let's plot for home. I mean, even getting home is a dicey business because you've got all of the re-entry stuff and that's not trivial at all. No, 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 no. I want to plot. No? Sometimes. Okay, uh, yeah. Something like that. Wow. Why would it give me that kind of... Uh, I mean, we don't have any inclination to speak of. Well, hardly any inclination to speak of. But it's giving me... Well, I, oh, it's because the moon is so far below. You can see it's at uh, this end of its, its cycle. So I guess that's why. Okay, so I'm planning to go in at uh, 65 kilometers periapsis, and hopefully that'll be a good uh, air breaking altitude for this. I'm not sure. There's a lot I'm not sure about when it comes to this particular vehicle. But we have five minutes. We need to jettison all of this. I don't think this... Well, actually, you know what? Well, no, they wouldn't have used this portion for... We, we'll test... Uh, do the test properly. We'll properly test the LOK portion and see if it can uh, handle the burn back to Kerbin um, and we'll dump all this because uh, this wasn't meant to be part of this anyway. Alright, so let's see if the rest of this assembly could bring back uh, Kerbal back. And that's really what the Apollo 8 mission would have tested among other things. Okay, so I'm going to activate. This is uh, the 
closest approximation to the right uh oh we've got a very unstable fuel flow though so we're gonna have to do the spinny thing in order to get the fuel flowing right for this one um, yeah so this is the closest approximation I could get to the actual rocket that they, that they used and how much delta V well we've got a lot of delta V we've got 1231 according to this um, which might have been a little bit more than they had. I think they had like 1,100 uh, and something or something like that. Okay, so uh, spinning does work, but we're not at the node yet, so let's hold off on that. Okay, well now we are, and it's probably unstable again. Yes, it is, so let me do the spin. You use centrifugal force to push that fuel into it. Okay, there we go. We are burning for Kerbin slash Earth. Actually, come to think of it, well, I guess they wouldn't have dumped the Ford portion. They may or may not have dumped the Ford portion here. Uh, I don't think they would have. They would have kept it. It's a long trip home and you need all the space you can get. Yeah, they would have kept it. Okay, here's our orbit coming down now. And we should have enough uh, left over as far as uh, fuel is concerned for the uh, deceleration burn close to Earth slash Kerbin. I do intend to actually uh, keep this sort of Soyuz uh, system that I've got. Uh, that's why I uh, spent so much time making sure the mass was right. I, I want to try out uh, some interesting missions if possible uh, using a Soyuz system. So maybe look forward to that in the future. And I'm using RCS to fine tune my approach now. I'll get it to, uh, well we skipped off the atmosphere with the Apollo and so I'm going to get let's say 65 would be alright so we don't have to uh, do uh, skip off the atmosphere alright so I'll see you in uh, Kerbin Sphere Influence let's uh, time warp and go okay so um, yep I need to tune it a little bit more as usual uh, time warping through a maneuver node it changes things a bit so just a few taps of RCS will do. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I mean, uh, Danwin is on his way back. It's a very nice vehicle altogether. And it's not quite a Soyuz, but uh, very, very close, I think. And uh, yeah, let's uh, time warp and get to where we need to slow down a bit. Ooh, always very uh, worrying looking at it like this. Okay. Let me turn around and make like I'm going to decelerate. But I will wait a little bit longer. We might as well just use up all the fuel in the service module. I suppose I could plot for it. Let's not say there. Well, that'll be way more than we have. 
say around there. Really, you don't have to be very deep in the atmosphere in uh, Earth to really get captured by it. It's very, very soupy in the high levels. And of course, uh, it, it really ex extends beyond 103 kilometers, so that's why it's so soupy, even at 70 kilometers. Okay, I think uh, definitely... Ah. Right, I uh, need to spin in order to get the engine started. And I think I need to also say activate engine now that it failed like that. But it's still risky. Very stable. Oh, went too far, went too far, went too far. Come on. There we go. And I'll also burn some of the RCS probably. Actually, even before this burn, I should have dropped off the top portion, which uh, doesn't contain any kerbals and doesn't need to be uh, rescued. Okay, well, anyway, that's that engine. So let me do that. Let me uh, decouple. And I'm going to use RCS to push me away from it, but also I want to decelerate. But I want I need to be away from it, otherwise we're just going to keep knocking into it. Okay. So I'm just going to use up RCS, our nitrous oxide, in order to continue deceleration. And then I'll drop off the service module, which will free up our very important heat shield. Sorry it's in the dark, folks. Uh, as usual, returning from the moon, it's a little bit hard to... Well, I mean, in theory I could plan for hitting the light side if I kept them in orbit, and with all the food, water, and oxygen we have, I probably could have. But... Uh, in practice, I didn't want to wait all that time. Okay, we really need to... We're hitting the atmosphere now, and that's why I'm suddenly getting frame lag like crazy. Um, two frame... Ah, now we've got it. Okay. A little bit of a transition time when we've got a lot of lag there. Okay, well, I don't see... I mean, I, I'm not c confident that uh, we have slowed down enough, honestly. But I also think we need to dump the service module before things start exploding. And RCS is not doing enough for us. So, RCS off. And... Well, let's make sure we've got enough food, water, and oxygen up here. Okay, yes, and let's... Uh, there we go. Alright. We don't really need the maneuver node anymore. Let me get rid of that. And I'll be in the dark, but uh, we're going to have fireworks anyway, so... Plate of shielding is holding. Ah, uh, electric charge is diminishing. I, I do have a solar panel on this po portion, but we're on the dark side, so I can't get that to recharge anything. There are drogue chutes and the main chutes. All that's real chutes. The key is G-forces. That's, that's the trick here. On the Apollo 1, the G-forces were quite mild, but I think I did more of a deceleration burn. And also we did the skip off of the atmosphere, which helped. 
As far as G-forces are concerned, that helps. Really, uh, one thing that playing with the real solar system mod teaches you very quickly is that, uh, as long as you have deadly re-entry installed, is that re-entry takes a long time. Re-entry must be quite harrowing, because, yeah, I mean, it takes very, very long to slow down from these kinds of uh, speeds. And it's just quite incredible. I mean, just imagine sitting in there wondering if you've got a successful uh, return or not. I mean, obviously, uh, generally it's all right, but you never know. And of course, with everything going crazy outside, you always have to worry. Oh, are we going up again? Uh, looks like we might skip a bit. I don't know. I don't think we'll skip all the way, though. I don't think we'll skip back out of the atmosphere. We'll see. Uh, it all depends. Uh, if the apoapsis, of course, goes below 103 kilometers, then we're not going back out of the atmosphere. And that would be a much more preferable situation. I don't want to have to go all the way around. I think we would probably run out of electric charge for one thing. Well, cancel that. We wouldn't run out of electric charge because we would go on the bright side and that would recharge us. Right now it's diminishing quickly because partly because of SAS trying to hold us steady here. Yeah, I think this will be a much more textbook skip off of the atmosphere instead of going all the way around. We'll be brought back in and we'll stay within the atmosphere. So this is a very good this is a very good situation for Danwin. This will save him a lot of G forces. The electric charge, though, that's a problem. I uh, and the issue is that I hope that this end is really much heavier than this end, and that we will continue being oriented like this, even if SAS is not holding us. As long as that's true, then it's fine. How much is SAS taking? Yeah, it's taking up the bulk of that. I'm gonna turn it off right now, since we're heading up anyway. Ah, uh, without the SAS, we've got a little bit of a rotation going. That's not going to be too much of an issue. Well, there's nothing for it. We'll be headed down, and we're headed down on the dark side, and I can't see whether we're going to hit mountains or not, because it's too dark. I'm sure the Apollo landings, uh, the Apollo returns definitely tried to ensure daylight landings. I mean, they did not want to have to search for the, the command module that uh, slashed down in the dark. I, I don't think they would have wanted to do that. So, I mean, I'm just using logic here. I think they would probably have uh, been careful to plan for a, a daytime splashdown. These are the kinds of considerations that lead to very narrow launch windows. Okay, head down again. G-forces rising. Temperatures, very good. Very good. Gonna use SAS to hold us stable now. No point adding the g-force of rotation in addition to what Danwin's already experiencing. G-force has peaked and is diminishing, so to worry about the rotation right now. Electric charge is running out, so that's why I turned off SAS. But it looks like, uh, at least as far as reentry is concerned, Danwin's okay. Uh, G forces were manageable, 
And now it's just a matter of parachute deployment. I know it's dark. It's dark for me too. I can't really see too much. I'm trying to use the Milky Way in the background to do my best here, but... Okay, I think we're clear for a drogue shoot deployment. Okay, cool. Well, it seems to be rocking the vehicle quite a bit, but otherwise it seems to be cool. Next we'll have the detachment of the heat shield and main shoot deployment at approximately well, we don't know how high the terrain is right here. Can't really see anything. So, hmm. Uh, main shoot deployment's at around 100 meters per second. Now, the actual Soyuz. Uh, actually had uh, retro rockets fire right on touchdown to slow its ascent. Uh, there's no real need for that here, so I didn't add them. Would be amusing. I, I might uh, uh, toss some separatrons on at some point just to have that effect, but um, yeah, not not the most necessary thing. I'm not too sure what... Yeah, I mean, I'm not too sure why the parachutes can't just slow it down properly in the first place, but uh, of course it's not splashing down, it's landing on uh, hard soil. The Soyuz rockets land on land. Uh, the Soyuz capsules, return capsules, are have to land on land, so that's a bit tricky. Okay, main parachute deployment. And heat shield is off. Let's see, can we sort of shake the heat shield off a bit? It seems to be loose. It'll fall off once the parachutes uh, fully deploy or produce enough drag that uh, drag of the heat shield. The drag of the heat shield is pretty substantial too. So, we'll see. It's not strictly uh, critical that the heat shield uh, be decoupled, but it'll save some mass for the parachutes to deal with. But the capsules are actually light enough so that the parachute shouldn't have any tr trouble at all. Okay, I think uh, we're good to time warp a little bit. I don't know how much though because we don't know the altitude of the land. Well, we're out of uh, electric charge, so hopefully we can get home soon. Without knowing the altitude, I don't know when the parachutes will want to deploy, and therefore when time warping through it might be dangerous. Oh, why do... Uh, oh yeah, the reason I... Don't I don't have uh, Kerbal Engineer or Mech Jeb on here? Otherwise, I would have a sur surface altitude reading. Don't have that, so can't do it. Okay, I heard uh, the drogue shoots have opened, and now the the heat shield has come loose and fallen off. Okay, we're still above safe velocities for touchdown. It looks like we might be over the ocean, in fact. And that's based on the altitude that the drogue chutes opened at. Well, maybe a little bit higher. So, some sort of land, maybe? We'll see. 
Okay, our parachute deployment is good, our velocity is good. Yep, all is well for Dan and Kerman. Okay. All right, once it settles down, splash down, 12 days, 1 hour, 32 minutes after launch. Quite a long trip for Dam and Kerman, but a successful one on the M1 rocket. Um, the M1 is really tough to fly, so I don't know if I'm going to cherish the idea of uh, trying to launch it again with more Kerbals so that we can actually land on the moon, and I also have to figure out that uh, uh, lunar transit stage, and so that will be a little bit complicated. So can't guarantee I'll I'll do this one again, but uh, marvelously successful. I thought uh, I thought it was a good solid mission, Danwin, and I think we should be proud of it. All right. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments, suggestions, leave them in the comment section below. Don't forget that this whole N1 escapade was. Uh, sparked by a comment so please uh, if you have any suggestions contribute them and I'll see you next time